The 2019 Teacher's Guide to Technology is here from my friend, Jennifer Gonzalez. Go to coolcatteacher.com forward slash guide and stay tuned for more. Pioneering Excellence for Better Computer Science Now, Episode 433. The 10-Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. Today, we're talking with Doug Bergman, educator from Charleston, South Carolina, and author of Imagine the Possibilities of Computer Science Education, a book that came out in 2018. Doug A last stat I heard was less than 10% of schools in the the United States have computer science. We have been talking about it for so long. We need to imagine the possibilities, but what are the possibilities and how do we move it forward? Yeah. So I think part of the big problem is simply people just don't really understand what computer science is. And so therefore, how are they going to possibly incorporate it into their schools or into their districts when they themselves don't even know what it is? There's all kinds of baggage that goes along with the definition of computer science. There's confusions with computer literacy and digital literacy and just using computers. I think that's been part of the problem where they'll think we're doing computer science. We have a Microsoft Word application and and a database and a spreadsheet class or something like that. And they just don't really know. And I think because they're intimidated a little bit and it is a little bit scary because I think people have some stereotypes in their mind about what computer science is that are 20 and 30 year old stereotypes. And I think what we've seen over the last 10 or 20 years and especially over the last five or 10 years is computers and the computer science side of computers, the ability to to dive in and create things using the computer science tools has become user friendly finally. And so the regular average person is able to kind of do things now. And I don't think schools know that. I think they're so scared to go down a a road which they don't understand at all. And in fact, it's not that scary of a road at at all for those schools that are just willing to sort of test it and realize, wow, this isn't nearly as bad as I thought. In fact, exact opposite. Our kids love it and they need it so much. So what are the possibilities? Part of the issue is that many schools across the country are just starting it now in high school. And that's great that they're at least taking those first steps. But by high school, a lot of kids have already sort of found some of their passions and sort of made some decisions on what their curriculum path is going to look like through the high school. So we need to be moving things down into the middle school. But we can't stop in the middle school. We have to be moving things down into the lower school so that people look at computer science as just one of the courses and one of the disciplines that are just part of a regular person's life so that it just becomes something that we do in school. Of course, we do computer science because every single major, every single industry, every everything they're going to do out in the real world is going to involve computer science at some point. There's not a single industry I can think of that isn't driven. All the tools and all the gadgets, all the, the things that help those industries do what they do are mostly going to be digital tools. And so someone has to create those tools and we need people who are experts in those areas to do it. So we need people growing up through the school system that we have, both public and private, doing all the science and the math and the history and all the normal core courses, but also having computer science in there. And so it's a it's a big jump to take, but I think that's one of those jumps that when people make it, they're going to look back and say, why didn't we take this jump earlier? So Doug, part of the problem is perhaps the difficulty in finding teachers that are either willing or qualified to teach computer science. How do we address that? Yeah. So unfortunately, we didn't, you know, industry themselves doesn't have enough people to do the technology based computer science jobs that they need, much less the schools to do it, much less in high school. And so I'm suggesting we go even the middle school and the lower school. So this problem is only going to get worse. And so at some point, the the laws of supply and demand have to work in our favor. And I think they are. I think as as computer science becomes more user friendly and people become less intimidated by, you know, the current, for example, the current generation, we're going to see a lot more people sort of go into that field. So it's going to take us a little bit of time to get there. I think right now in the high schools, we struggle because some of the high school classes are a little more advanced and it does take a little more of expertise. So either a person with that actual background or someone who doesn't mind just diving in and taking a chance and learning it along with the kids. And by the way, the kids do not mind that person who is a a beginner themselves, but at least gives them the chance to do it because they love these coding classes. But I think especially when you get into the middle and the lower school in the elementary school grades, I think there's opportunities there for anyone who just loves their technology 
technology to be able to jump in and, and explore some things. There's so many websites, you know, the code.org style of websites and the Microsoft websites, which offer so many resources and tools for someone who's, if they're, if they're just willing to say, you know what, I'll try this computer science thing in my third grade classroom, in my sixth grade classroom. And there's all these tools and resources that will lead you through it. And then, and they're so user friendly, the kids pick up to it. They don't need nearly as much help as you might think they do. In fact, they could actually be helping the teacher along. So I think it's going to take a little bit of that mindset to make the shift. And I think once we start making the shift and schools are seeing some successes and that word spreads that you don't need to worry about this, just take the leap. I promise you're going to be fine. I think they'll start doing that. I think people, I think teachers will start to become attracted to the schools that are doing it because they're a little more innovative and forward thinking. And I think teachers like to be part of communities like that. Yeah, and helping folks understand that you can have an introduction to computer science class and have an overview class and cover the history of computing and talk about understanding computer science and prototyping. And I mean, aren't there some entry level ways to introduce kids to computer science that don't require coding? Without question. Yeah. And, and so there are, but, but we don't need to be afraid of the fact that it requires coding. I think the kids really just, for whatever reason, they, they naturally gravitate to it. I mean, we do, it, it truly, we're a, we're a private school and we're K through 12 and we do it in every single year, literally. And the, the kids can't get enough of it. The teachers that have sort of really embraced it, which is pretty much all of them now, and they see the energy around it. It's not anything we need to be really fearful of. Now, how you code in second grade, obviously, is different than how you code in seventh grade, which is different different than how you code in the 8th or ninth or 10th or 12th grade. And even in college, so there's different ways of coding or programming or, or I don't even know those are the best words, they're just creating things with technology. And there's so many tools out there that allow a person with different skill sets and interests and backgrounds and ways of looking at technology to come in and build things and create things. You know, whether you're the artist or the science person or the math person or the sports person, there's so many tools out there. So we don't need to be scared of the word code, but there are, there are so many things. I mean, we in our freshman high school course, for example, I assume that people come into my class with absolutely no experience. Okay. And we spend four months doing Python code and our kids will write 400 lines of code. And yet they started with nothing. Right. And so, yes, it takes, it's a process and it's project based, which we think is a, is a, is a definitely the, the way to get it. But there's ways to figure it out with a teacher that sort of knows how to do project based learning where the kids can sort of figure things out themselves, which means they learn it in, to me in a deeper and better way. And so, we do app design, we do robotics, we do Python with kids who have never seen this stuff before and they do it. And so, and I've my high tech star kids and I've got the kid who's barely even touched a computer from the previous experience. And so they are doing it. So I think for this, again, for the schools that are willing to just test it out with the teacher that's willing to just try it out and test it, I think you'll find that the kids will jump right in and all the hesitations that someone may have had to, to give it a shot are going to just melt away. Doug, do you think you could just quickly take us through the ages and stages? Like what apps and tools are you using by grade level, maybe starting with kindergarten and then just moving up? I don't know if we have it down necessarily by grade level, but in the lower school, we have, you know, like the Osmo robots, which are a different kind of robots. And they're, they're, they're not coding like you might do in an upper school computer science class, but it is still that computational thinking. It's that logical thinking. This the idea that I want to, I need to accomplish this task and it's going to take me four steps to do that task task. Here's step number one, right? And so they can do that. And so really in those earlier years, all we really want them doing is sort of building something that that didn't exist before they came to it. You know, this robot or whatever the device is, wasn't moving in a straight line and picking up and detecting the thing in front of it before you sat down. And then after you did this thing and you you programmed this computer you, by, by using this tool set, which is, you know, age friendly, it now is doing that. Well, there's something extremely gratifying when a kid does that. So at that level, that's the kind of thing you're doing is sort of like these. And they, there is some words around it called block based. And there's a ton of websites. You know, the whole code.org curriculum is block based at those age groups. We love our robots. And there's some dash robots that kind of do the same things. So there's just something about a kid controlling a device that's unconnected to them, that's on the floor, interacting with this environment. And we do that. And we do that with the science classrooms. We have the kids mimic with a robot that it goes and it picks up recycled goods and it goes and delivers it to the recycling center. Well, the kids actually program the robot 
robot to do that one. So in the lower school, it's more like that. We integrate it into the classrooms and we have them do things like that. And we, in the fifth grade science classroom, we have them create predator prey games or at least interactive experiences that emphasize the, the, you know, the strategies of the prey, you know, the hunted and the huntee and the kids, all the vocabulary that the teacher wants to use are in that, right? When we get to the middle school, we start to dive a little bit deeper with some of that block-based coding and we start to go more into the, you know, you got the the series of Lego robots we use in there. We do use the Dash robots in the fifth and sixth grades. We actually do some Arduino, a little bit of work on that. There's some cool music related programs we use on there. And then we start to let them explore a little bit of text-based coding. Minecraft has some some text-based Python coding on the back end you can use. We do that in our middle schools. When we get to the upper schools, we're doing languages like Python and C Sharp through game design and robotics and app design and cybersecurity. We do some drone programming. We do some just simulation programming. We do some programming that uses the human body as the input device as opposed to a keyboard and a mouse. And we take apart computers. And so we're just sort of doing a bunch of different things. There's so many types of technologies you can use and software programs you can use. And really depending on the passions of the teacher, of the students, you can share a variety of those. In my book that I wrote, I have a ton of resources that goes through this exact same question with a ton of examples and websites and names and sort of price ranges and that kind of stuff as well for people who are interested in that kind of thing. The book is Imagine the Possibilities of Computer Science Education. K through 12, yeah. Yeah, K through 12 from Doug Bergman. And thank you, Doug. Jennifer Gonzalez has released her 2019 Teacher's Guide to Technology with over 200 education technology tools, including tools for assessment, flipped learning, presentations, parent engagement, video engagement, and more. In this guide, you get a simple description, a screenshot of the tool, and a play button that takes you to a video about how the tool works. Learn more at coolcatteacher.com forward slash guide. Now, I am an affiliate for this product, which means I am paid a small percentage of the fee if you purchase it. This is at no additional cost to you. And I only recommend the best products for educators on the 10-Minute Teacher. So, the 2019 Teacher's Guide to Technology. Hope you enjoy. Thank you for listening to the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast. You can download the show notes and see the archive at coolcatteacher.com forward slash podcast. Never stop learning.